This is what we're in God's house this morning is to praise our Heavenly Father in song, in testimony, in, in spiritual uh, beings or spiritual reading, whatever you might have this morning. We want you to lift it up to our Heavenly Father. Someone with a testimony before we go any farther. Bless you, Angie. Amen. 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 Someone else this morning. Someone else. Bless you, sissy. Bless your heart. Someone else this morning. Someone. Say congratulations. We I, I didn't I didn't figure forty six years. You don't look like you're old enough to be be married. You must have got married when you were two or three years old, would you? Something like that. But congratulations. <laughs> I should I better back up, get out of the way. I'm gonna get out of the way and let Sister Jan come and lead the choir this morning. So be much in prayer for the choir as they come this morning. <laughs>
Come and dine at the master's table. Come and dine. You know, I, I see some things this morning that the, probably the congregation don't see. We've got a young lady so anxious to sing for her Jesus this morning. She keeps creeping up this way. And I wish everybody was that way this morning, creeping for Jesus. So if you want to participate, creep up on Jesus this morning and sing. Come on, Paisley, and sing for us this morning, sweetheart. I hope I didn't embarrass her. Good girl. stir your heart up a little bit this morning. Someone with a testimony this morning. Somebody with a word of praise. Yes. My niece, um, this past week has been a roller coaster. Uh, my sister-in-law is still in ICU. Uh, she's still on a vent. And um, we had some encouraging news Thursday night that she was making some improvements Friday morning. They tried to take the vent out and then we had it out for a couple hours and had to put it back in. So um, we, we really covet your prayers. Um, she needs a lot of prayer. She needs a miracle from God. And I know he's able. Um, and I ask you also to remember my mother-in-law, Mary. She's, um, she's really caring a lot with this. And, um, but 
I'm thankful to know that God's there for all of us. And he's carrying us through. We're thankful for that. Amen. Thank you, Debbie, for that. that, that reading about your sister Paul. Someone else this morning with somber testimony. Mike, you got a song this morning. <laughs> Angie, you got a song this morning. <clears throat> Ruth got a song this morning. Chris, you know, John. You know, uh, there's your brother. Brother. There's your brother. It's amazing how God works. I'm working with five guys now, and I'm the only Christian in the bunch. And I thought, Lord, how in the world is this going to work? And uh, they're very respectful of my belief. And they, they play music, and I don't care. But every once in a while, I say, all right, guys, I need a little Christian music. <laughs> and the other day, we all got a little blessed. It's starting to work on them. Amen. They played several songs, <coughs> several. And then the next day, they're, they're listening to the music, working. All of a sudden, one of them says, hey, put a little Christian music on them. <laughs> and I had to stop working. I had tears in my eyes. I had my hands raised. One of them looking at me, and I could see the tears working in him. I'm saying, see, it's real. And I got a chance to talk to him all the way home. And it's nothing I did. It just, it happened. Amen. God gave the words. And he's talked to me several times since. This, this is not just a testament. This is a please pray for these guys. Each one of them has so much they've come through. I've got two of them who are recovered drug addicts. A third one trying to get clean. And the other two know where they need to be. They're just not. And I'm just, I think, who am I to show them? But my heart has gotten really heavy for these guys. And um, I just want it to continue. I don't want it to stop. I want it to continue. Just, <sighs> can I get anointed for this? Amen. I want this to work. It's not the job. I want this to work for these guys that need him. You know, sometimes just when you think you're not doing anything, he'll prove you wrong. Yeah. And you don't have to be. I, I, I remember Bo's Van Over, one of the greatest evangelists I ever knew. I mean, he was a true evangelist. He would go and he'd bring his little camper out, and you would see him. He would work the, the community he was at, where he was at. He, he worked that community. And you think, how can I ever be that type of person? You don't have to be that type of person. You just have to be a person. You just have to be there. And when God says, talk to him, just open your mouth and give you the words. When you, when you have the opportunity, don't shut up. Open your mouth. This world needs God. And it's going to go further and further away from him. And if the Bible has already said it's going to happen, and I just want those around me to go with me. 
I'm going to make it. I, I know I'm going to make it. I can't not. To see a burden like that for the lost, Ron, Amen. tremendously important that we don't forget about the lost. That's yes, why we're still is. here, isn't it? You know, that's why that we're to be the light of the world, and and if they see Christ, it'll be through us. So they, there's a huge responsibility there that some people don't take serious, but uh, I think the world needs it now more than ever. So thankful for that. So thankful for 40 years of marriage. Today's a day, and you know so. You know, I've, I've always, I've always said, if you study out the, the word of God there, where, where he parted the Red Sea, that by interpretation is Mary putting up with me. So, so, <laughs> so, but, uh, but she, she's been a blessing, that's for sure. But, you know, Ron, just like, just like that uh, testimony you gave of all those that need Christ, I certainly needed him too when I was lost. Amen. And uh, Jim requested this song and. And that all I ever be is a sinner saved by grace. It's nothing by nothing by me. You know, some people think, well, if you're born into this kind of a household or raised in a Christian environment, or if you're whatever the case might be, you know, if you're raised in money or or privilege or whatever the case, uh, you know, that you might have an advantage. God only sees the blood of Jesus if it's applied to your heart. If it's there, you're saved. If it's not, you're lost. It's that, it's, it's really that simple. So it doesn't doesn't matter what where you were raised. But but uh, I'm thankful that the Lord did convict and convict my heart one day and helped me to be able to see that I had a need of Him as a personal Savior. It's been the, it's been a great ride with Him ever since. You know, I don't know how I'd ever make it without Him. And uh, you know, I. The Lord does give you encouragement when you need it. You know, I, uh, I'll try to be quiet here in a minute. But, but you know, I, I was telling a guy up to work just the other day that I work with a lot of, uh, of residents like Ron does that are, are drug rehabilitation people and things like that. I don't work so much with the females. We have them in the, where I work, but I don't work directly with them no more than what I have to because it's just not a good, it's not a good relationship building type of tool but I had one one of the ladies one day that was getting, we're getting ready to graduate she'd worked over in the in the kitchen and, and she asked to see me she was getting ready to graduate she asked to see me that morning and I my natural thought sitting back here in the office well here we go you know there's gonna be a gripe about one of the one of my, one of my people that work for works for me and whatever the case might be Came back and you know, and I got that encouragement that day because she came back with tears in her eyes and thanking me for the for for living the life in front of her and and I don't know to this day I don't ever remember talking to her directly but we don't know who's watching us do we you know but any reflection that comes from good out of me certainly belongs to him because I'm just a sinner saved by grace so so thankful that the Lord does give you those little increments of encouragement when you need it to be able to know that yeah if you're doing the right things people are going to watch and they're going to they're going to watch see what you're made of and uh you know the, that certainly don't mean perfection because i'll fail him every day but uh but it means we do the best we can and try to live as good as we can for him so you pray for me
What to say, but I am a sinner saved by grace, also, Brother Mike. 39 years ago, Jesus saw fit to save this old wretched soul of mine. He's still saving today, folks. If you're lost and undone this morning, God can save any sinner this morning. All you have to do is say, God, here I am, ready to confess your sins. Jane, you go sing for us this morning. Come on, sing for us. <laughs> He's speaking to you, Jim. When he moves among us, all that he does, all of his mercy and all of his love, if the pen of the right. 
writer could write every day. Not even this world could ever contain how I have been blessed. Warmth in the winter, flowers in the spring, laughter of summer and changing of leaves, the food on my table and a good place to sleep. The clothes on my back and shoes on my feet, I have been blessed. I have been blessed, God's so good to me. Precious are His thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them, there's not enough time. So I'll just thank him for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. Arms that can raise, a voice that can talk, hands that can touch, and legs that can walk. Ears that can listen and eyes that can see. Oh, I've got to praise him as long as I breathe. I have been blessed. A father and mother nurtured and raised. Sisters and brothers memories made. Our pastor to lead us, this altar to pray. Stripes that can heal, and the blood that still saves. I have been blessed. I have been blessed. God's so good to me. Precious are his thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them. There's not enough time, so I'll just thank him for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. We live in a country, the greatest on earth. Our flag stands for freedom and what it is worth. She stands in the harbor, Miss Liberty calls. All have given some, but some gave it all, so we could be blessed. He's my shoulder to lean on when I am down. The rock where he leads me when I'm overwhelmed. The place where he hides me under his wings. He's not just a song, he's the reason I sing. I have been blessed. I have been blessed, God's so good to me. Precious are his thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them. There's not enough time, so I'll just thank him for being so kind. God has been good, so good. I have been blessed. God, you've been good, so Thank you very much. Certainly appreciate those songs. Sister Angie's going to sing for us this morning. She's creeping up here now. <laughs> you know what? If I had a voice like Mike, I'd be creeping right here. Amen. Amen. But I'm not blessed like he is. 
Um, I'm going to send this song out to Dad. Um, he has yet another procedure tomorrow, so please just whisper a little prayer for him. And um, just getting so tired and so eager to see Jesus. And everybody else is struggling right now. Every storm seems to be a little darker. Bless your heart, Angie. I know better than try to talk before I try to sing. Bless you, sissy. Bless your heart. Every storm seems to be a little darker. Every burden seems to weigh a little more. Every river seems to be a little wider. But I feel I'm getting closer to the shore. Lord, it's just another hill that I'm climbing. Lord, it's just another tear you wipe away. If I can just hold on a little longer, I'll be rejoicing in heaven someday. Often trials and troubles gather round me, and I feel I'm in this valley all alone. But this morning. I have certainly enjoyed this part of the service, and I know if we reflect upon the the Holy Word, we'll enjoy the next part of it. Brother George, come on. Good morning to you. We're going to dedicate that little baby girl back there. Next week, right? Next Sunday. And then we're going to baptize her mama uh, after that. So, see, you have a child this week or you get saved this week, you can get baptized next week too. <laughs> we'll just throw all that in there, right? We're going to have a Sunday school picnic August the 16th at 9 o'clock in the morning. That's a Sunday school breakfast, isn't it? Uh, but anyhow, it's going to be at the Legacy Farm. That's Deaver Road, Lucasville, so they're just asking that you bring a picnic lunch. Bring your own. Some of you won't come because you don't like your own cooking, right? So, But we hope you do. 
The book of Acts this morning. The book of Acts. Chapter 16 of the book of Acts. <laughs> wow. You guys are fast. Charlie is there already. Let me see. No, it's not written down anywhere over there. <laughs> That's where I'd be preaching. I don't know how he knew that. So. Do welcome you all. Not to put them on the spot too much, but uh, I will. We do have a couple here. We've got two couples celebrating anniversaries. One today, one what, Thursday, Tuesday? Who knows? Marie's like, oh, she doesn't know. She doesn't know. She just knows it's coming up. And then we've got a couple that's going to get married this evening, about 4.30 here in this church, and they're sitting right back in that corner back there. And so uh, congratulations uh, to them, to uh, Dana and Rox, Roxy, Roxanne. Uh, we're just stick with Roxy, right? But good to have you this morning. Do you ever wonder why you go through things and don't, did you ever think it's kind of, it's tough to have to go through something just for somebody else's sake, isn't it? Your life gets terrible just so somebody else can get something good out of it. <laughs> you have a hard time just so somebody else can learn a lesson, but, uh, but we can learn lessons as well. And I know I spoke from um, a portion of this scripture uh, not long ago, but uh, I want to take you back to uh, the book of Acts in chapter 16 and I want to look at this morning some of the things that, that, that Paul and Silas went through and the reasoning behind. Now, they didn't, um, let me ask you this question. If you knew you were going to do something that would get you beat and thrown into prison, would you do it? <laughs> There's a lot of people seem like they're doing that nowadays and they're not even getting thrown in prison, right? But um, if you knew that you were going to be uh, persecuted for the name of the Lord. There may be people who would never choose to follow the Lord if they lived in another country because there are countries where following the Lord isn't as easy as it is in this country. Um, so somebody makes fun of you a little bit uh, and calls you a name here and somewhere else you may get beat for serving the Lord and being an open witness. So so these fellows didn't exactly know what was going to happen to them, but they knew who they believed in. The Apostle Paul even uh, says that in the book of Romans that he knows in whom he has believed and he's persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto him against that day. So, so Paul's faith, Paul and Silas, their faith is strong. They go um, through um, the city and they find the little woman that comes behind them and uh, she is a... Um, um, a teller of fortunes, and she is going and and saying these men are the uh, servants of the Most High God. And we know that he cast out the demons out of her. They are thrown in prison. And here they are in prison. Now you have to realize the prisons uh, then aren't like the prisons today. I've never been um, incarcerated, but I've been in the prison. I've been in the jail and I've seen, I've been into a prison, Brother Brad Harris, which by the way will be here Wednesday evening preaching for us and singing a few tunes. Uh, he and I uh, were invited to come to the prison in Chillicothe there, the correctional facility, and so we went and of course they inspected our guitar cases and everything and we went in and played a few tunes and we had a good time, but this was a little different experience for these men. One thing that made it different for these men was they were beaten before they were ever cast into this prison. Um, this wasn't just, hey, we're going to go in here and be locked up for a little while and they're going to let us out. But because of what they taught and because of what they believed, the scripture says in verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And so now here they are in the inner prison. They're beaten, 
And so their backs are, you know, we can't even take a hangnail sometimes. And here they are beating their backs probably raw. They're probably bleeding. And then to get them in there to make sure because this prisoner is, or this uh, prison guard is charged uh, with their keeping, he even makes their feet fast in the stocks so they cannot get away. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Whatever it is you're going through in your life, and I've sat back knowing what I was going to preach this morning. Charlie only knew where it would be from. I knew what it would be. Listening to your testimonies, and I'm just thinking, God, you have a way of making everything fit hand in hand and hearing folks uh, some of the things that were mentioned about today and about working with people who watch you and about people seeing you who you didn't know were watching you but seeing the things you do. Can you imagine that here now these two men have been uh, beaten? They didn't say, let's go down and take the hard way. Let's go down and, 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 and get beaten, thrown in prison so we can witness to people. Would it be something if you knew today that God gave you a perfect opportunity to witness to somebody on the street and you choose not to do it, so now he allows something terrible to happen to you, so you will do it? <laughs> I mean, I mean, they could, have, uh, they could have went, but here they are now. They're at the midnight hour. They prayed and sang praises. I think it's very important for us to realize, too, that there's not much singing praises coming if you're not praying. But there was something different about these guys. There was something different about the relationship that they had with their father. See, they weren't just religious people. Um, before I was a Christian, I would, uh, you know, my parents, they, they lived a life that wasn't. They lived a life that was. I was probably, I, I go over this in my mind, but I know I was probably about eight or nine years old when they got saved. I saw so many things at the time, being eight and nine years old, that I probably should never have seen in the first place. But then I saw a ton of things different out of my father. Uh, I won't push my mother so much. Well, for one reason, she's watching this. But, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, if, if we could say it, the two of them, she wasn't the problem. He was. So I saw such a change there. But when I became of age and Teresa and I got married, and, and uh, the last thing I ever wanted to do was go to church. That was the last thing I wanted to do. And Teresa and I get married, and it wasn't long. We're driving. We had an old, if I could even think of the year, probably a 1979 or a 1980 Dodge station wagon of, or a Plymouth Valari, you know, one of those uh, wagons, big wagon, and here we'd get in that thing to go because we were just young people, you know, just, just, we loved each other so much. We'd go over where we'd go to the pit stop and get a beef jerky or a Slim Jim and, and a Mountain Dew. Man, what a meal, huh? You can't ever call me a cheap date, right? But one day we were driving. And it's funny now because when you think about things, you kind of think, you picture yourself being like you are now. I wish I could go back and just look. <laughs> no, we were nothing like we are now. So here we are, these two little kids in this car driving around, and she starts singing this little song. And she starts saying, have you ever heard this song? And she starts telling me that her mom, after her dad uh, was killed in an automobile accident, her mom took those girls, walked them to church, and they'd, they'd go to church. And, and in church, they would hear these songs, and then her mom would start singing, and all the girls would chime in, and they'd, oh, it was like some people can't take nails on a chalkboard. When she started that stuff, I thought to myself, are you got to be kidding me? I mean, I just leave a house of a minister and his wife, and I've been made to go to church all these years, and, and now I'm free to do whatever I want to, and Teresa and I are married not long, and she's singing Christian music to me, and I'm thinking, this is not what I wanted. Um, but it was what I got. And God knows what he's doing, and even in situations where things may be brought to your remembrance later, these fellows were doing what they did 
When they were working for the Lord, they were doing it because of who they were, not just all the people around them they could influence. But they were influencing people, and they influenced these prisoners because when they heard, it says, when they prayed and sang praises unto God, the prisoners heard them. So the other fellows that were sitting there heard what was happening. And, you know, I don't know what they would have been in there for, but I said it wasn't like our prison system today, and no doubt they probably none of them were happy to be where they were. But as they were there, can you imagine hearing these two fellows knowing? They probably get the word why they're in there. They've been beaten. But now hearing them pray, and I wonder what they're saying when they're praying. Are they praying, God, help us to have enough strength to witness to all these knuckleheads that are in here now? Are they praying, God, we thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for everything you provided for us. God, we thank you that you saw that we were worthy to be beaten for your name. I don't know what they were praying, but they didn't start with the song. They started with prayer. And when they started with prayer, when they finally touched God, when they started with prayer, then they began to sing. And uh, I think probably sing a little bit in the spirit, right? Um, and these other fellows heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, we just um, heard that uh, from Angie that if her sister-in-law is going to get better, it's going to take her, from Debbie rather, if her sister-in-law is going to get better, it's going to take a miracle from God. And I know that's what Mary's praying for. I know that's what the family is praying for. Uh, but sometimes we... We look at things and don't really understand or realize when a miracle has come our way. We can look at that little baby back there and say, what a miracle. And there are sometimes miracles that are in the making for us right now that we have no clue about. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have no clue. These fellows didn't understand that their bands would be loosed, but they were never bound spiritually. They may have had their feet in the stocks while they were in there. They may have been beaten, but still inside they were just as free as can be. How many of you know who Stephen Curtis Chapman is? He is a contemporary Christian artist. Uh, I was never fond of that stuff, uh, never fond of that style of music. This was before Caleb, and I was pastoring a church, and our kids were just young, and versus them listening to rock and roll, our son said, well, is it all right if we listen to this? And we went to uh, Cincinnati, to Kings Island once, to, uh, to have a youth day with our church. And so we load them up in the van and all the youth there, and they said, we're going to go over, and there's going to be a show of these artists. And, and I'm thinking, eh, that's really not my thing. I like music, but that's not my style, but I'll go. And he impressed me that day and has always impressed me. I've got his music. I've, I have have a lot of his um, uh, songs downloaded and stuff that I've listened to, but there's a song that he wrote. He was talking about Chuck Colson, who had worked with the Richard Nixon administration, who had done some time uh, in prison, who is now a Christian commentator and author and stuff. And he went into the prison ministry with him. And one of these prison visits he went in, he sat down with the gentleman and ended up writing a song about it as he came out. He said, but as that man was in there, said that he was in there for life and would probably die being in there for what he did. Although he was locked down, he was free. And in this song, he said he began to listen to the reason why he was free. Though he may have been bound in there and not able to get out, still he was free. Well, Paul and Silas were free. Everything that had happened to them up at this time, and even their feet being in the stocks, did not hold them from being free in the Lord. All the other prisoners and the guard, all of them, and the keeper of the jail, all of them were bound. Even the people that worked there were bound. You say, wait a minute, they were not. Yes, they were, spiritually. They were bound. They were the ones enslaved. And the whole reason for Paul and Silas being there, taking this beating and being in here at midnight, is so these fellows could have their eyes open to what they needed. I say it's not always easy to go through something difficult, and sometimes you stand back. Teresa and I were talking about something just yesterday, and I said, you know, I know we're not supposed to understand everything. I said, but... Sometimes I just like to 
I just think it, you should be able to rationalize why things happen. And there is a, a point in our life in the last couple of years that we've looked at, and I just stand back and shake my head. I just say, I still do not know why this happened. Why has this happened? It's boom. You could just see some things happening, falling in place, and then all of a sudden, chaos. I'm like, what in the world's coming out of this? I can't see it. But I know I'm free, and I still have to be who I am and do what I do because there's somebody else watching, no doubt, watching me. And so here, uh, the scripture says that the keeper of the prison, he's awakened now out of his sleep. In verse 27, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is a pretty big turnaround here. This conversion that's getting ready to take place of this jailer probably never would have happened or it would never have happened at this point anyhow, but it probably would never have happened if he had never came in contact with Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas probably would never be in this prison if they had never came in contact with the little, little soothsaying woman that was going about uh, possessed with the devil and telling the fortune of these people. And so for all of this mess, this guy probably never would have been saved if it wouldn't have been for somebody taking a beating. Now let me tell you something today. None of us would ever be saved if it wasn't for somebody taking a beating for us giving his life for us. And we could sit down and try to rationalize why things happen. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? But I know that there are things in our life that come against us that we have no clue of knowing why. Somebody asked me here a while back. I was asked this while I was in college. They said to me, and when I say college, folks, you have to understand, I was 36 years old. This was adult education. This wasn't like some guy gets out of school, you know, and, and going to go four more years. I'm glad they can do that, but um, I knew if I'm going to pay money for this, this has got to be something I want. And at this point in my life, when the, when the college professor said to me, why is it that you do what you do or want to do what you want to do. And I'll tell you the reason I do what I do now today as a hospice chaplain, why I try to help people as much as I try to is because I watched my father go through a period in his life where he ended up uh, leaving this world because of certain things. And I always thought, uh, always in the beginning I held a grudge. And I did. I wasn't a Christian. I held a grudge against God. I held a grudge against Christians. I held a grudge against churches. I wanted nothing to do with that stuff. When God brought it back to my mind and showed me, I understand that what he went through made me go what I've been through. And when I have went through what I have been through now, I, it finally made me stop and say, God, I need help. I need my eyes opened to what is happening. <laughs> A family member said to me shortly after um, I had prayed and asked the Lord to come into my heart, we were talking. And he said, what happened to you? <laughs> I mean, what? Uh, you're, doing, you're doing this, 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 and then all of a sudden, boom, you're not. Let me ask you something. You know how hard it is to quit habits? <laughs> if you've ever had them. Well, when you get saved... Some people think, okay, I'll get saved, and all of a sudden, every bad habit, your pockets that's got stuff in them, everything will start dropping. And the chances are for some of that stuff that may be, but you're human, and so some of that stuff is not just going to drop. Some of that stuff is going to be things, if God condemns you of it, there will be things that you release and you let go of. They won't be easy sometimes, but you'll have God there to help you with those things. And so what he's looking at is how can you have been this way one week and all of a sudden this way the next week? And the best I could say to him was, I found myself saying, God, if you're real, I need help. I need help. And guess what? He proved to me that he was. Now he's proving to these men that he is. 
This jailer comes forth after this earthquake, and every man's bands were loose. The jailer's like, man, they're going to kill me. Uh, I already put them in the inner prison, uh, supposed to keep them because this is my life. Now everybody's escaped. And when he found out they hadn't all escaped, even Paul cried with a loud voice and said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. So he comes in with the light. He springs in. He looks around. He's like, what must I do to be saved? So that's, that's a big question, isn't it? I probably said this before here, but I worked with a gentleman years ago who said to me, if I come to your church, will you save me? And see, I don't know why you guys chuckled, but I chuckled as well. I just did. Because I understand that I can't save anybody, and you understand that too. That's probably why you chuckled. But I chuckled, and he got mad. He didn't like it at all. He said, am I not good enough for you to save me? That's what you do. You're a preacher. That's what you do, right? You save people. And I said, oh, no, wait a minute. I said, I, I didn't mean to offend you. I said, no. No preacher saved me. I said, the preacher just comes. He preaches the word of God. When he gives the invitation, if you come and ask the Lord to forgive you, the Lord's the one that does the saving. I, I can't save you. Uh, I said, I, I don't have it in me to save you. That's not my, my, my ability is to tell you about the one who will and can save you. So what must I do to be saved, he says. Well, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And he spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he spake to them the same hour of the night and washed and, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his house straightway. And he even brought them a meal to eat after this. And afterwards, we will get into this, but afterwards, they were going to say, okay, you guys, you can get on out of here now. And Paul said, no, wait a minute. You beat us <laughs> for no cause. You didn't even know who we were. We're not leaving until we get to settle. But anyhow, the biggest thing that happens in these verses of Scripture that we read is this jailer comes to the knowledge that he needs the Lord. So Teresa and I yesterday were talking, and I said, Teresa, when we, when we moved to Myrtle Beach, it was a, it was a, um, I was sitting in the, in the office parking lot over in Lucasville. I get a call from our office in Myrtle Beach. If you want this job, it's yours. You can have it. I called a friend of mine who uh, I had talked to. He knew he'd been praying. He said, what would you do? I said, well, man, I'm not. You know, it, it's my head swimming at this time. You know, Mama's here. Mother-in-law's here. Kids, everything's here. Everything. Pastor church, 14 years. Having service, uh, you know, that coming evening, all that stuff. I said, well... I would never move if we couldn't sell our house, and boom, first thing that happened right off the bat, met someone who wanted the house right on the same road we lived on. I mean, it was just within five weeks, I was in Myrtle Beach. And I would, and you know, I mean, I would, I told Teresa, I said, it's so strange to wake up in a place where people save all year long to come to one week out of the year. And, and we're living there. Get out of your vehicle, you look down, there's the ocean. I said, I, I don't even understand. But in that period of time, in that four and a half year period of time that we were there, and I still don't know why, God allowed it to happen, and I'm thankful that he did. And uh, we honestly, some, my, somebody asked me back here from churches every once in a while, somebody would call, we'd talk, and say, uh, how long do you think you'll be there? And I said, I think I'll be here till I die. And Teresa has already said, you can bury me here because people don't visit graves anyhow. She said, I'll send you back to William McKinley and we'll box you up and do whatever you want to do back there, she said. But, and so I honestly thought that we would end up dying there. That's what I thought. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> okay, you've been here long enough. <laughs> I'm back. So here I am, and it's probably best that I don't know, but here I am yesterday for whatever reason trying to walk through the people that I met in the Myrtle Beach area. What effect, what reason? Was it so they could affect me? Was it so that I could affect or infect them? Was it, was it, and I know there were people that were lost there. 
I know there were people that no one else ever reached. Does that mean no one else ever could? Maybe no one else ever tried. And maybe God used me as a missionary for that. I know there was a family, there was a woman as soon as I started pastoring this church, and there was no pastor. The, the husband didn't much care for any pastor. Any There was no one that ever reached out to him that ever made an impact. And I said, can I go to the hospital and see him? She said, well, I'll, I'll tell you, you can go, but I don't know how he's going to like it. Well, I went and he did like it. And after that, uh, when he got back, he shows up at church one day and the people in there about fell over they couldn't believe that he was there and still to this day he loves me and I love him maybe it was for that one man I don't know why Paul and Silas were beaten we could have said was for just this jailer and his family but whatever this terrible thing was that uh, they suffered at the hands of those men that beat them there was a there was an answer that it helped somebody. What must I do to be saved? Maybe they wouldn't have, I mean, maybe they would have strolled down through there and said, hey, y'all, you know, you need to be saved. Here's your track. <laughs> we'll just leave you this little track, read it when you get spare time. But they were a little more concerned after they'd been beaten and thrown in the prison. And I don't know about you, but who would you rather see witness to your family? And we heard this morning about uh, the brother saying, uh, how he appreciated the evangelist that came through, and I remember him as well, and how he appreciated Brother Clovis Vanover. He said that he thought, man, he was top-notch evangelist. Would you like to see Paul and Silas roll through town to witness to your loved ones? <laughs> There's probably no one better, right, to come through. Here it happens for a reason. What must I do to be saved? Big question. I'll leave you with this. Chapter 10 of the book of Romans. Some folks would call this the Roman road. Verse 8 says, But what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart? That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Sometimes people say it's just too easy. It is just too easy. If you take those verses and look at them, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. It didn't say you, you understand how he did. You understand. It didn't say that. It just said if you do. If you do, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth because confession is made into salvation, then you will be saved. And I don't know what's happened in your life to bring you to the point where you understand this. <laughs> I know just speaking to some yesterday, there are people, you see, we live in a different age now. Used to we couldn't say this. There are people watching this, but there are people watching this in other states today who would uh, no doubt need this message or take it back. I, I listened as Angie came up and said she would send this song out to her father. Well, that's, that's what you do when you sing on the radio, you know. I want to send this out. But now we have the ability that her dad can watch his daughter sing this song here. These messages and these songs and these testimonies, even after we're dead and gone, will linger on because they will affect somebody. It always means something when you bring God's name up. These men prayed. They sang praises. Boom. The prisoners heard. The chains were broken. And a whole family was saved because of this. And, it, and I wish we could. I wish we could find in the Word of God where uh, the story of this uh, uh, Philippian jailer's family and how they were great after this. And But I don't know what happened to them. All I know is they were saved. They believed in the Lord. They were baptized. They were ready to go, right? Whatever it is that brings you to that point in your life, always be thankful for it. I'm not... Uh, I'm not happy that my father passed the way my father passed. But I can tell you one thing. It was the death of my father that brought me to a screeching halt. It was the death of my father that brought me from a 21-year-old young man who was living life for himself to stop long enough and then start considering other people's feelings, uh, to start consider where I was going to go, where I would spend eternity, and I still look at it today. 
Uh, my mom asked me one time, she said, name one good thing that came out of his death. That's the good thing. Did it have to happen? It didn't have to happen, but since it did, God showed me, and I believe that God allowed that to be used to bring to my mind, just like these men being beaten. Did they have to be beaten? Did they have to be thrown in prison? Maybe not, but they were. And that's what it took for that Philippian jailer to say, I want what you got. Stand with me today, if you will. We'll take just a moment. Just a moment. And if you're here today and you have a need, you would like to pray. I know we do, we've been doing things a little different here, but uh, I'll ask you with your heads bowed, if you would. No one looking around. You, if you've been to church much, you know this is, this is the, the routine way preachers do, even when I was a kid. The preachers say every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, and the kids would peek their eye open and look around. Some of the adults may do that too. You're here today and you need the Lord. Can you just lift that hand and say, George, pray for me. I need God. Anybody here today? You're here today and you're asking the Lord for a special touch today. And he knows that. And I'll ask the church to help us pray with it as well. Anybody here today, God, please, um, I need a special touch. Anyone by an uplifted hand, George, remember me today. I want to ask you to pray with me. Lord, as we come to you today, God, we do pray. Lord, you know the needs that are here in this building. God, you know the hearts of men and women. You know the things that we go through on a daily basis, Lord. And each one of us could tell a story today, as Teresa had mentioned, uh, about our story and our song. And each story would be different, God. But help us, Lord, to be able to look and say that uh, in the middle of that story and in the middle of that storm that we find peace through Jesus Christ. Whatever the need is here today with those folks that have raised their hands, God, you know their needs. I pray that you would encourage them, strengthen them. Some I know uh, have uh, health needs that uh, you will help with that and, that and bless them, God. I know that some uh, no doubt may have financial, they may have uh, physical, emotional, whatever the need is, God, I pray that you would bless for those people today, Lord, who may watch this, who may at some time uh, just drop in on this service or maybe pick it up sometime, pick up their phone and all of a sudden it's there, maybe uh, when they start searching for something, maybe when the rough time comes in their life and they look through uh, something that they can find answers for, maybe they'll find this message today. Maybe somewhere they'll find it said, uh, what must I do to be saved? And God, I pray that you will help them to understand, to believe in their heart, and to confess with their mouth. And that salvation comes through that, Lord. And we're thankful for that, God. We love you. We're thankful for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, any announcements before we dismiss? We're having Sunday school after this. Ron, you teaching Sunday school today? Okay. Yes. Well, annoying the cloth for Brother Roy. You guys going up after service? To... I'll anoint it and you can come pick it up. How's that? Well, I'll pour the oil on it. God will anoint it. How's that? <laughs> we, better, we better get that one clear, huh? We do love Brother Roy. He was going to teach Sunday school this morning for us, but uh, when I.